Yes, I've got 50 perfect biomarkers. Yes, my body runs three degrees Fahrenheit cooler. And yes, I have 100 chronological age markers. I'm sorry, 100 biological age markers less than my chronological age. But to me, that speed of aging is really the most significant thing because you think about it, it's, it's almost like the new wealth creation. The longer you're well and healthy, the longer you can be engaged in productive activities. And if you're slowing, you just have a prolonged clear, a career and you're more productive in what you're doing. This isn't your average business podcast and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. So Brian, I don't know if you remember, yeah. I've interviewed you twice before. Once, I think shortly after you sold Braintree or right around then, and then another time on the podcast here. So I do remember you, James. It's great to see you. I, it was, good to see, it was you. great to see you, your name show up and I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, me too. I, I mean, I've been following your very exciting adventure and essentially trying to reverse aging and you, you have all this metrics and measurement for success. It's like, you know, the whole Silicon Valley concept of measure what matters. Like the only way to mm. truly reduce aging is you've got to measure all these different metrics to determine how you're doing and if your plans are working. So when did you get started in all of this? You look great. You look completely different than the last time I interviewed you. <laughs> I, it, when I show up to social events now, I'm, un I'm unrecognizable. People introduce themselves. I'm like, of course. Hi, James. Like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. And, and do you think just on the looks part, do you think that's a result of kind of just all these habits you're doing? Like it's just changed the, you know, like working out obviously changes how you look, but sleeping well, eating well, all these supplements, do you think they all contribute? Yeah. I mean, several times throughout this endeavor, face ID has not been able to recognize my face anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's not just humans, it's also technology, but yeah, my body and my face and my mind, it, everything has transformed almost beyond recognition. And it, I guess I would, I, it's almost like a psychedelic experience. I did ketamine as part of a kernel study where I did 68 milligrams of uh, intramuscular ketamine. I wore kernel flow, which is the brain imaging device we built before, during, and after. And when you're in a uh, psychedelic experience, you can't prepare somebody for what they're going to experience. You can use words and say, this is what an altered state of consciousness feels like, and this is what you think about, and this is what how your mind moves around. But nothing you say can actually prepare you for the actual experience. And I would say the same thing is true with, with Blueprint. I even if I went back in time and I tried to explain to myself what it would be like to do this program for two years and then emerge feeling and being and doing, I don't think I could have really persuaded myself that uh, to a level where I understood what would happen. Well, there's so many, there's so much to unpack there. And I even want to ask you about the ketamine because I've also uh, tried a similar experience with, with ketamine. But, you know, when did you first think to yourself, I'm aging and mm -hmm. I don't want to? <laughs> Because you know, when you're, you're in your thirties, you still have that feeling of immortality. Like, like mm. there's a lot of evidence. If you're in, your, if you live a healthy thirties, you could feel a lot better than in your twenties. So it's unclear yet that how you're feeling is a result of aging. So when did you first realize, oh, age is happening to me? I mean, there were two really significant events. Uh, the first was in my twenties when I was building Braintree Venmo. I had this problem of self control. So the combination of building a startup, being in a challenging relationship, having three little babies, being depressed out of my mind, and leaving a religion, a religious community. What, what, was, what, what religious community did you leave? I didn't know that. I was born Mormon. Mm, okay. Which is, I mean, anyone who's been in that kind of religion, it's an uprooting of existence. It's not like you're part of a social club and you no longer want to be. It's you have to reconstruct your reality, your community, your family, your friends, yourself. It's an entire, entire redo of self. And so in that process, everything was piled up and it was extraordinarily challenging. I was depressed out of my mind. And every night I would try to soothe the, soothe the pain of life by eating. You know, I would all day long, I would do really well, eat well in the morning, in the afternoon, I'd exercise in the morning. I would talk myself up all day long, like the nighttime's coming, 
I'm not going to do it again. And then seven o'clock would roll around and I would eat excessively, trying to soothe my pain, trying to get the hit of eating the wrong kinds of foods. Then immediately afterwards, of course, we know what happens. I feel depressed and shameful and I feel guilt and I feel awful about myself and my pants feel too tight and like all the things that we know that happens from that. And I was reflecting on this, that I had this, this capacity, this seemingly endless capacity to commit self-destructive behaviors, that I did these things and I could not control myself from basically accelerating aging, disease, and death. And it was almost like a philosophical quandary. Like why would I, as, a, as an intelligent species, be incapable of talk, uh, stopping myself from this self-destructive behavior? And so one day, playfully, after failing for several years of being able to combat this, I fired my evening self. So I just identified the, the biochemical state that occupies me from 7 p.m. to 10, 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. and said, evening, Brian, I know how you behave. It's reliably in a self-destructive way. And you come up with the most clever rationalizations and explanations and persuasions to make me do these things, but you make my life miserable. Uh, every, uh, morning, Brian, daytime, Brian, in the mirror, Brian, dad, Brian, you make every other version of Brian awful, you're fired. You mm -hmm. cannot eat food no matter what. And it was the first time I made a, a positive step in a psychological way to say, I am different versions of me all the time. I'm not just one unified Brian. I'm hundreds of different types of Brian's. And to give him a name and to identify his thought processes and rationalizations was the first step to say, this self-destructive thing is really kind of a big deal. And I need to get my, my uh, hands around it. So, so there's, there's a, again, so many things, interesting things to unpack there. One is this concept that, and people don't think this way, but it's really true that you're really a combination of all the different versions of yourself. And this is easily measurable. Like, let's say you're a poker player. If, if you're a poker player who's going through a divorce, that year you will see you will lose more money than mm -hmm. poker Brian who is not going through a divorce. I'm just making this up. I don't know if you play poker or not. But that's just like one simple way to measure something like that. That, that different contexts and states of who you are, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you really just, your overall performance in life is the average of all these different versions of yourself. But when you say you fired Evening Brian, what does that mean? It means that I, I gave him a name. So I identified this version of myself. I made him a persona in my mind. I identified when he shows up, what his arguments are, how he persuades me to do things, what a personality type he is. And then when I... And when I would confront him and say, all right, Evening Brian, you're here. I recognize you. You're here. You're here to persuade me to eat this bag of Doritos and this gallon of ice cream. You're going to tell me that this is somehow a good idea to soothe my pain, that somehow life is going to be okay if I do this. I've heard that argument before, and I know how I feel if I do that. And so by doing that process of writing this thing down and making it formalized, I basically said, you are a source of tremendous self-destruction. You're done. And then I would say, even Brian, no. And then I could, in my mind, I could see this version of myself on the floor, throwing a tantrum, punching holes in the wall, like just flipping out because his control had been taken away from him. His authority had been taken away from him. And it's a, it's a psychological trick that worked. Like before, I'd always try to work on self-discipline or I'd try to work on commitment or I'd try to work on like every other tactic to try to do it. Nothing worked, but only by separating myself uh, psychologically could I do this. And the second thing that led to Blueprint was one day I was flying an airplane. I really enjoy aviation. And I was at 9,500 feet and I was flying the, the plane with, the, with my hands, like a little left, little right, little down, little up, like trying to keep it perfectly in uh, looking at the attitude indicator. And I, it was a fun game to play to try, try to keep the plane perfectly steady. And then I flip on autopilot and it just pegged the attitude, like just absolutely perfectly. It didn't have the deviations that I had of like slight left, slight right, up, down. And it did it because it has all these instruments around the airplane measuring everything at the at the at a speed and precision that I'm incapable of, and it made it perfectly uh, straight. And I thought that's amazing. What is it? Would it be possible if I could build an autopilot for Brian, like my autonomous self? And really, that that it was those two ideas which kind of brought it together when the creation of Blueprint. And so the Blueprint is basically. Uh, my autonomous self, I measure all the organs of my body, heart, liver, lungs, and I say, hey guys, how are you doing? And what do you need to be your best self? They report out how they're doing with data. 
We then match that up with scientific evidence. We create pr protocols and that's what happens. So my body, my organs run me, my mind does not, which specifically means I cannot go to a restaurant and order from a from menu. I cannot go into the pantry and peruse for food. I don't decide spontaneously to do a pizza party with friends. My organs are entirely in control of what I do. And this is because you've determined statistically that, for instance, when you eat this, this, and this at this time and in this amount, your heart performs better on your measurements. And then when you eat this, 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 your sleep is better. When you do this, 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 your brain is better and so on. And so that the, the way you've measured these things and the statistical consequences of them, that, have de that has determined many of your habits that you have now. That's exactly right. I mean, you basically think about it from a technological perspective. We use navigation, uh, technological navigation, because it gets us to our destination more efficiently than if we had a paper map in our lap. We, you know, we, we use technology when it helps us achieve our objectives in a more efficient way. We use calculators to do math that we couldn't do on paper and pencil. Uh, so we choose technological solutions that help us achieve our objectives. And in this case, I've built an algorithm, I've built a process that takes better care of me than I can. And I really need to pause on this point because it, it is such a significant thing. If I have been able to do this in a bootstrap way with a small team, and I've shown that basically it's a better manager of entropy, like it just looking at the law, like basic laws of energy in the universe, it could almost be said that I've proved inevitability. If I've done it once for me in this bootstrap way, it's for sure inevitable for everyone else because we will adopt it. it if it takes better care of us and, and, and it produces more fullness of life, we may kick and scream against that. We may come up with all these really clever arguments why we hate it. We may think it's the worst thing ever, but in time, as we know how these things go, we will all adopt it because it's better than what we're doing right now. You know, it's interesting because look, we know, for instance, about cigarettes, that people who smoke a lot, like if, they, if you smoke three packs a day, on average, you'll live 11 years less than people who don't smoke. So, so what you're saying is almost like an advanced version. Like if I cut out smoking, I'll live 11 years more than average. If I cut out drinking, I'll live five years more than average and, and on and on. And you've, you've highly specified it to like specific organs as opposed to just, just general lifespan. So, but, and yet people know this about smoking and they still smoke. So mm -hmm. what do you think, you know, obviously you have like this extra level of discipline and you had these turning points where you were doing these bad habits and then you figured out kind of almost tricks, psychological tricks to get yourself to have better habits. And then you took it to this extreme that's very beneficial. Mm -hmm. But do you think the average person will be able to, to do this, even if they want to reverse the aging on their life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. Even when a smoker knows that smoking accelerates aging, disease, and decline, they still do it. Now, if you ask why, I'm sure they're going to they're gonna give you a clever story why. Like, there's all kinds of clever ways to justify it. Really, this question begs, who deserves to be in charge? And this is the battle I was having before in the baby step of recognizing Evie and Brian, and then uh, asking my body, hey body, if I asked you to take care of me, heart, liver, lungs, what would you do if you were in charge? And that's the answer. And so this is really a much broader question. It feeds into this. I've been thinking deeply about the future of intelligent existence, not just the future of humanity, but the future of intelligent existence. Uh, for example, like what is the 24th and 25th century going to look like? And when they're gathered together in whatever forms they exist, and they look back at the early 21st century, the time we live, what are they going to say that we did that was so fundamentally, uh, that changed the fundamentals so dramatically that we made that majestic future possible? And my primary hypothesis is our minds, which we think are our primary tool of problem solving and our most sacred characteristic of existence is actually the reason for is actually the source of our self-destructive behaviors. And so if you think about this from a micro scale, 
individually, my mind, if you, if you say, what behaviors do I have in life that are accelerating my aging and what behaviors in my life are uh, slowing my rate of aging? And I try to put fingerprints on that. My mind has the majority of uh, things that are accelerating my aging and my body is doing things that slow my rate of aging. We treat planet earth in the same way we treat our bodies, hopelessly committing self-destructive behaviors and hoping that technology will save ourselves from ourselves. And so it's just, it, to me, uh, if you zoom out on planet earth and you try to quiet all the noise going on and you say, what is really going on? Then I would say there's, there's three things. One, that uh, artificial intelligence is improving at a stunning pace. Two, that the earth's biosphere, the biosphere is in question. And three is we humans are dangerously at each other's throats. And if yeah. you look at all three of those things, you can point to the mind on our eagerness, willingness, and almost non-negotiable disposition of letting our self-destructive minds be in charge. And so when I thought about that, I thought, how could I even create the, like the, a baby step of showing an alternate version of existence where the mind doesn't have unquestioned authority? And it was diet because we can't do it. You can measure every organ in the body. You can look at scientific evidence. You can implement these protocols. You don't need a brain interface that gets to every neuron of the brain to do this control. You just basically just say, hey, organs, speak to me with data. I wanted to show a proof of principle of another way of existing that does not have the mind as the central authoritarian actor. It's, it's so it's so interesting, and you're right. And by the way, I don't think the mind is necessarily an enemy. It's trying to protect you. Like when you were eating a gallon of ice cream, it wasn't because the mind was trying to ruin your life. It was trying to say, look, you're, you, hey, hey, Brian, look, I, you know you're feeling bad. I have just the thing that'll make you feel better. Like it's almost this weird, simplistic act of self-preservation that makes you do bad things. It's because the mind is not smart. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the way I, I speak about this, I, I certainly am speaking at it from a very high level. And if you go down a second, third and fourth layer and start looking at it with more pedantic, uh, with more precise definitions, totally agree with you. There's a ton of nuance in this conversation and in these arguments and in all these things. And I'm making high level generalizations as, as if it were a simple bifurcation mind body. We know that's not that simple, but as, as an introductory to this idea, just the basic idea that as I've become aware of my mind and I watch it operate, its fingerprints are all over the behaviors, which I don't want, which I know are not in my best interest. Now, I know I see my mind do this all the time. It whips up all these gorgeous stories on why it has to have its power. It, it just is inevitable that it does that, but it just, it's, it tries to, cl to cling on to this thing. But you know, like, it's, it's funny when I empower my organs, my kidneys never out of line. It's never like, yo, let's go get slammed tonight and stay out all night. Or it's never like, hey, let's smoke a pack of cigarettes. It just doesn't do it. Like my body is not a devious, uh, devious actor. It can be trusted with what it's reporting out. So it's interesting. Let's, let's get to the specifics of like for many of your organs, so you're in your late forties and for many of your organs, statistically, they're like, you know, perform now like somebody who's in their twenties or even mm -hmm. younger. Like you've had max mm -hmm. reversal on some, some mm -hmm. organs. What's, What's been the best for you in terms of, you know, anti-aging and, and what seems to be kind of causing the most problems? Like, and overall right now, you're, you're, you know, there's a way of measuring biological age as opposed to chronological age. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, for listeners of this podcast, uh, we've spoken about this with David Sinclair, who's an expert on anti-aging. But overall, what would you say your biological age is now versus your chronological age? Yeah, I mean, I left my mother's womb 45 years ago, mm -hmm. and then biologically, I'm hundreds of different ages. And it depends on what you're looking at. We use MRI and ultrasound for imaging. We do all the biofluids, blood, saliva, uh, stool. We do a fitness tests, DNA methylation pattern, microbiome, eye tests, ear tests. Like we do hundreds of tests. And so to me, the most impressive thing we've done in two years time we've slowed my speed of aging by the equivalent of 31 years. And that means that, uh, and, and a recent test of mine is even better than the data I'm going to share with you right now. So this is, this is old data. It's actually better now, but the old data was, um, 
I now I'm slowing. I, my, my pace of aging is slower than 88% of 18 year olds hmm. and slower than the average 10 year old. So when we look at 10 year olds, we don't think that they're accumulating aging damage. They are, we just see youthfulness, but humans accumulate aging damage throughout their entire life. And in my case, I, my body is accumulate aging damage slower than the average 10 year old. And so, yes, I've reversed my epigenetic age by 5.1 years. Yes. I've got 50 perfect biomarkers. Yes. My body runs three degrees Fahrenheit cooler. And yes, I have hundred chronological age markers. I'm sorry, a hundred biological age markers less than my chronological age. But to me, that speed of aging is really the most significant thing because you think about it, it's, it's almost like the new wealth creation. The longer you're well and healthy, the longer you can be engaged in productive activities. And if you're slowing, you just have a prolonged clear, a career and you're more productive in what you're doing. So, so in order to determine um, the, the pace of you know, age-related destruction, and I'm, I'm going to ask a naive question. Is this related to, like, for instance, so-called telomeres, which you know, cause cellular death and like, the, the rate at which you know, you're losing telomeres or whatever it is? Is, is mm -hmm. that how you measure the, the pace of age destruction? Yeah, it's using DNA methylation, and it's based upon a multi-decade-long study out of New Zealand, one of the long, one of the longest-running studies with the highest retention rates, and it correlates with life intervention. So it's responsive to caloric restriction. It's responsive to dietary changes, and you you can get a like a person can get a blood draw and then look at the cholesterol and triglycerides and a bunch of other markers. There are uh, calculators to say if you combine these fifteen things, what's your age? So there's a number of ways to look at this age. This pace of aging one is really interesting because it is so responsive and we've been doing it over a certain duration of time. To have some fun with this, we created rejuvenationolympics.com. And so I wanted to, people uh, observe what I'm doing and it's clearly outside the norm, right? Like I'm not following uh, a normal lifestyle of the early 21st century. And people struggle sometimes to make sense of it. And they then will use words like biohacker or someone interested in health and wellness. It just didn't quite cut it. And so I started referring to myself as a professional rejuvenation athlete. If you look at LeBron James and what he does to take care of his body and what time he goes to bed and what he eats, you don't think he's weird for doing it. You respect him because he's trying to be his best on the court for, for his profession. The same is true with me. I'm a professional rejuvenation athlete. And so this rejuvenation Olympics. Uh, leaderboard looks at speed of aging and basically says, Hey, if you're into this world of health and fitness, come compete with other world athletes and see who's best. And that way, you know, like it, one of the biggest problems with health and wellness is it mirrors religion. And that if you, if you take the, the, the uh, Bible, it robustly supports hundreds of, of denominations that all claim they're God's one and true only church. And they just fight among each other chapter and verse. Health and wellness is the same thing. People are fighting chapter and verse over health and wellness. And I wanted to say, which leaves most people confused. They'll say, how do you even know what's right? Because everyone's so confused. I wanted to punch through the noise and say, let's compete with data. No more human opinions allowed, just data. And that's what the Olympics is, is really invited to do. And when you have a stable marker like speed of aging, you can punch through the noise and say, all right, where's this person at? What's the... The one number that represents their overall health, uh, health and wellness, and so it really has helped create some clarity for people who have been confused. Do I do this or that? And you know, choose your guru based upon data now. Wow, I want to I want to compete in these Olympics. So but, yeah, um, great. But before we get into like specific techniques, I'm just curious, just like what have you noticed personally that has most changed in your life, either mentally or physically or emotionally or whatever that that you've noticed since beginning on this journey. To me, the most interesting evidence is I've been fairly public over the past maybe 15 years in speaking publicly about various things, whether it was when I was building Braintree Venmo or whether it was when I was building OS Fund or Kernel or whatever the case may be. And I say, if you try to qual uh, quantify the quality of my ideas, the quality of my output of, the, of my mind. I would say, I hope this is true, 
that my, the quality of my ideas has significantly improved in the duration of time when I've been rigorously engaged in this. And I'd say that, you know, I, yeah, so I just say that, like the evidence maybe speaks for itself. And I think others would probably have to make that observation, not me. But that's the thing that, that really is most interesting to me is m less my opinion and more the evidence of what of the output of my mind. See, this is a really interesting thing because first off, so another person might say, well, I could run five miles instead of one mile, or I could, uh, 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 you know, do a thousand pushups now instead of getting tired after 10 pushups or whatever, or my metabolism is such so that I could eat a whole pizza and not gain any weight. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so there's various ways people in their minds judge aging. But I think it's very interesting when, when you say the quality of your ideas, because one thing that's potentially positive about aging is you get more experience and the brain sort of grows with that experience and you have a, a better ability to Mm -hmm. As opposed to like, let's say, calculating complicated math equations when you're, in your, mm -hmm. when you're young, when you're older, you have better pattern recognition, you learn from experience more, you have greater sense of wisdom, you know, if you're pursuing these things. And so it could be that aging is helping the quality of your ideas. Like what was, what do you think part mm -hmm. of the aging process helped the quality of the ideas? Yeah, I mean, to your point that I've seen several studies that have analyzed Nobel laureates in the various fields, mathematics and science and physics. And they, they plot out the age of the person when they made their contributing work. And so they show that there are patterns of peak performance. And I'm going from memory here, this could be wrong, but I think mathematics was something like late twenties. And so yeah. some, some uh, fields require a bit more germination, a bit more maturity to emerge. Other fields value the, the minds that are untainted from the previous generation who are able to deviate from the norms. And so I'd say the, you know, I've been, my primary professional concern, okay, let me say this. When I have nothing to think about, when I'm not obligated to think about anything in life, where does my mind naturally go? The future of intelligent existence. It's just the default place I land every single time. I love to think about it. Uh, I'm obsessed with the concept. And so as I thought about that and I tried to generate ideas around it, like what it is, what I can do about it, how I can articulate it, what we can do together. Uh, in the past two years, I'd say the highest value ideas I've ever had have emerged about that. And to me, these are extremely tricky things because you're trying to model out decades and centuries. You're trying to poke at the obvious things that exist right now that are impeding our progress, which we're oblivious to. And you can see this. If you read biographies or history, you can look back at a certain century and say, oh my God, like, uh, of course that's obvious. And of course that's inevitable. But when the person discovered it, no one else could see it. The, the frame that I love about this is talent hits the target no one else can. Genius hits the target no one else can see. And this is what I, I feel about my body taking care of me. This is the genius move that's right in front of us. If my mind leads me down this path of accelerated aging destruction, if it basically is unstoppable, if I'm helpless to, pow to overpower my mind, it's just going to do it. The solution to me is to acknowledge that and remove it from power and find an alternative source of power and management that does act in my best interest, my, my bodily systems. And if we say the same problem applies to planet Earth, that like, hey, this is a this is a pretty serious situation we're in, and we're looking at the same situation. We're helplessly self-destructive and destroying the the biosphere of our planet, jeopardizing all the future of our existence. What? Where's the problem source? Instead of pointing at the UN or or polluters, like point itself that like we are we individually are the cause of this thing in that our behaviors are helplessly self-destructive. So to me. It's trying to pierce through all the noise and the fog and find the the clearest possible thought. Now, I could be wrong, but to me, this feels directionally correct. So it, it, it's interesting because it, it seems like that's the one that's the hardest to say is the result of anti-aging. Because again, like you mentioned, there's there's different, like mathematicians in the early 20s hit peak performance, but historians in their 70s hit their peak performance. And so some types of knowledge and some types of wisdom gain from aging. And whether you're calculating, you know, 
what the world's going to look like hundreds of years from now, it's unclear which side of that it falls on. Does it fall on the calculation side or the wisdom side? And so it's hard to put an age to that style of thinking. But I see what you're saying. Like, do you, do you feel like other uh, parts of your thinking are more clear? Like, for instance, memory. Do you feel like your memory has improved, which is something that declines with aging? Hmm. Yeah, and this question requires self-reflection. And I know in this moment, I'm inclined to confabulate and uh, make up stories that make me sound great. <laughs> so I want to walk through this gauntlet of my mind because my mind is telling me all this stuff to say. I don't believe most of what it has to say. Uh, it has a bias in self-reporting to you. Uh, yeah, I think I would probably need to look at external evidence that is independent of my opinion. And that's why I guess I point at my ideas of independently, whatever I, however assess my conscious experience, what is the quality of my output in life? And what are, what are the potential clarity of my ideas? And uh, I mean, to, to me, so I call this these, I call this zeroth principle thinking. And it, to me, this is the, my favorite concept I've ever come up with. I was, for years, I was struggling to think about the future of existence because I would use my own imagination or my own creativity to reach out and say like, how do I structure my thoughts? And every time I could just tangibly feel my limitations, I just, I could feel my brain constraining me. I could feel my limitation of intelligence. I just can't reach beyond what I know. And I went, uh, before I was going to bed one night, I said to myself, hey, brain, could you please help me come up with a concept, a framework that allows me to extend beyond myself? And that night I, I came up with zeroth principle thinking. And the idea is, so first principle thinking is you identify everything you can uh, know in a certain duration of time. Zeroth principle thinking uh, is, so is, so talent is first principle thinking. It's hitting the target no one else can. Zeroth principle thinking is identifying the target no one else can see. And so Einstein's uh, special theory of relativity is a zeroth principle insight. Space and time has, have always been relative. We just didn't know it. In Newtonian physics, it wasn't considered. And then we introduced, he introduced that and it changed it. Another example is when AlphaGo beat Lisa Dahl in Go, like the 19 time reigning world champion, AlphaGo played moves in Go that Go experts said appeared as if they came from another dimension. It introduced levels of genius that could have always been played by humans for thousands of years in this game, they just never did it. And so it introduced these zeroth principle insights and changed the game of Go forever. And this is that the key is if we say, okay, artificial intelligence is now moving along at a certain speed, it's introducing these genius levels of insight, whether it's in protein folding or whether it's in the game Go or whether it's in nuclear fusion or wherever it's at, it's introducing this zeroth principle level of genius into human affairs at a speed we've never had before. And so the the future is not going to be human created or human designed. Humans are going to be along for the ride if we're lucky. And that's why attaching my body to science and technology to me makes the most sense. So the, I'm bridging a bunch of ideas here together. So if you no. piece this all together, <laughs> okay, so you piece this all together, we are accustomed to our technology improving in versions. The smartphone goes from version one to version two to version three version three has the improvements of version two and version one. We just know it improves systematically. You don't get version four and it's like, oh yeah, we, we did away with the previous improvements. And so we, we are accustomed to our technology improving systematically. With ourselves, we do not improve systematically. We improve a little bit, but we commit self-destructive behavior here. We have a rise and we have a fall of decay, but we basically, we accept that we humans are decaying and eventually going to die and we become martyrs for our technology to move forward. So we we basically are trying to give birth to immortality through our work because we are demising. We are going to demise. And that technology then is used against us to make us addicted to all the things in the world and make us even worse. And so what I was trying to propose was, could I, as a human, improve my physical being at a speed equal to the rate of scientific and technological progress? So if I basically say, hey, all of my organs, report out your stuff via measurement, report to the science, do these clinical grade protocols, and avoid all self-destructors from my 
uh, life, like remove my mind, my body is now improving at the speed of science and technology and health and wellness. I've attached myself to the closed loop improvement curve and I'm not messing with it by having my mind commit these self-destructive behaviors. And this is why I say it's so interesting is we then begin thinking about ourselves as this compounded rate of improvement and our technology being used solely for our own improvement, not to make us worse versions of ourselves. That gets us on this zero principle path where you can start saying, what can we become as a species? It's wide open on the frontier because we are now on the compounded path of improvement. And, and, and it's interesting what you're, it seems like what you're trying to prove also is that it doesn't plateau. Like you can, it, it's not like you're just stopping aging or slowing aging. You're trying to reverse aging. And so, so like physically, what's an example that you've noticed where it's very clear, oh, I had stopped being able to do X, but now I can do it and whatever. I would point back to accumulating aging damage slower than a 10 year old. It's stunning. I mean, as, as a 45 like chronic. How does that make you feel differently? Like, like for instance, I obviously haven't done that. So how do you think you feel differently than me on a daily basis in terms of uh, yeah. cellular damage and, and so on? I mean, I'll, I'll, for example, like, uh, here's my sleep data from the past 30 days. Mm -hmm. I have near perfect sleep performance. It's 99%. I have one, okay, two days that were less than 100%. Mm -hmm. So by the time you turn 45 years old, it's getting harder to get a good night's sleep. You toss right. and turn more, you're up uh, more at night, you go to the bathroom more. And I'm knocking out perfect nights of sleep. I'm in, uh, lo looking at the whoop data, I'm in the 99.4% percentile for sleep performance. And so, yeah, uh, we all know what it feels like to get an incredibly good night's sleep, how spry we feel in the morning, how clear our heads feel, how stable we feel emotionally, our level of ambition, what kinds of things we can take on. So like, there's evidence. I'm not even just going to say like, oh, I feel like I can run forever. No, like look at my sleep data. That's probably even more compelling evidence because we know what, um, what it feels like to get a wonderful sleep. And what about in terms of, um, you know, illness or, I mean, what are other evidences of aging? I guess, I guess like, you know, I mentioned memory, but also your, your, your skin starts to decline, your sleep degenerates. Yeah. Um, what are other symptoms of, of aging? Uh, I guess you get sick more or, or if you fall, you hurt more or, mm -hmm. you know, it's harder to recover. Yeah. Have, have been so I'll give you some, yeah, I'll give you like a few subjective things. And I guess I, I was avoiding your question a little bit because I don't put a whole lot of weight on these because they're like antidotal reports and I really want hardcore data uh, at mm -hmm. all times to speak. I just don't like human opinion, but whatever. Okay. I'll offer a few of my life experiences. So I have three kids, two boys, 19 and 17, and my daughter's 13. With my boys, I can do anything they want to do. If we want to race on a mountain trail, we race. If we want to play basketball for three hours, we play basketball for three hours. I can compete and or beat them at almost everything we do athletically, which is remarkable. Uh, I never thought that would be the case when my boys were 17, uh, 19 and 17 years old. Um, I have zero aches and pains in my body. Uh, nothing hurts. Um, I'm trying to think of other stuff, my, like my skin age. And, and when I look, for example, when my daughter and I compare the plumpness and elasticity of our skin on our calves, we're almost identical. Mm -hmm. uh, th she's 13. And so just these basic things, my kids oftentimes say the funniest things. Like the other day, my dad looked at me, he's like, dad, I'm so confused. Like, I understand you're 45 years old, but I'm just so confused when I look at you. And so it, it's really funny that these, all these different data points emerge. Um, some of my markers are doing very well. Like my left ear is still age 64. I have hearing damage from when I shot guns as a kid. And so there are things that are still uh, not, not resolved that I accumulated when I was younger. It's so much easier to not create the damage than it is to fix it. And right now I'm trying to fix basically a lifetime of damage. And it's just been the past two years I've really gotten serious about it. But boy, I wish that I would have had the wisdom and or received the advice to not engage in that self-destructive behavior in the first place. And so, okay, so in terms of like routine, there's a lot of things you do. And I guess one is like, I mean, you have this all listed on, on your website at the, the, the Blueprint, but 
just for people listening and for me, what are kind of like the basics of what you do? And then kind of related to that is mm -hmm. how do you know there isn't one thing that is doing 99% mm -hmm. of the work and everything else is just additional. Yeah. Like you do separate out each thing somehow for testing or there's, or there's prior studies and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Blueprint is so much easier to implement than people think. When you look at the website, it's a lot, it's overwhelming. I totally appreciate that. If you break it down, however, into the power laws, which you're talking about, it's so much more approachable. So number one, get good sleep and get it consistently. Like that's your number one objective in life. And so in our, in my family, we treat sleep like a lighthouse. You cannot negotiate with a lighthouse. It is, it's land. If you try to overpower it, you're gonna run your ship into the rocks and you're going to sink. So there's never a legitimate excuse for work or for play or for or watching a movie or whatever the case may be that deviates from your bedtime. When our bedtime arrives in the family, all lights shut off, everyone runs to their bedroom, and we do it. And we do it because we have a, a, a commitment to each other that we acknowledge when we are around each other, we become like each other. And nobody likes to be around somebody who's grumpy or snippy or, or you know, a downer. And we are our best selves when we get good sleep. So one, make sure you get sleep uh, as your number one priority. The number two, eat less and eat uh, a fewer things that are bad for you. If you can just get those two basic things down, you're going in a very strong direction. But what a lot of people do when they see Blueprint is they'll say, okay, what do you think about NR versus NMN? And they want to get in this super technical- I was going to ask you that question also. <laughs> of these super technical questions about these different molecules. Meanwhile, you know, and a lot of people jokingly say, and I'm asking you this question, it's 3 a.m. and I've got a bag of Doritos in my hand. And so people genuinely want to do positive things themselves. I know this, I did too. Meanwhile, they don't have the basics right. And so it's more important to get your basics right, tackle the hard problems. Debating M NR versus NMN is the easier thing. Swallowing a pill is an easy thing, but they are not powerful enough to get you in the, in the power laws. You need sleep and diet. And the other things are just tacked on on top of it. But if you don't have the basics right, you're not gonna do much. So, so there's a couple of things you, you said too about sleep and diet that are very interesting. So first off sleep, again, keeping it simple, what, what, what's the 80, 20 rule here? What's the 20% I can do to get 80% of the value of better sleep? Cause I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I, in the past 10 years, the quality of my sleep has gone straight down and it does affect yeah. my life. Yes. Dramatically, uh, bad sleep ruins life. I mean, we all know this, the difference between hope and despair is a good night's sleep. Like it just cannot be over overstated. So I'd say a few simple things. One, go to bed at the same time every night and your circadian rhythm is unique to you. So whether it's early or late, whatever you, whatever you do, just find your bedtime and do it every single night. Uh, I black out my room. So there's no light in there. Uh, three is I am fortunate in that I don't share a room with a partner. I sleep by myself. So I don't have the interruptions of another person's sleep routines. So I, I be, I'm able to isolate the parameters. And then four is I avoid alcohol. I, I basically don't drink any alcohol ever uh, because it just has a terrible effect on my sleep, no matter what time I drink it. And then fifth is uh, the timing in which you eat your last meal of the day and how much you eat, uh, I found dramatically affects my sleep. So again, choose your time of sleep and be consistent every day. If you can, uh, you know, black, black out your room, if you can sleep in a room by yourself, that's great to avoid having to, you know, uh, try to synchronize with another person and their wake up events and all that kind of stuff. Um, for the um, no alcohol and then five, your diet is. I, I found, for example, like if I ate certain foods, uh, it would just uh, ruin my sleep. Or if I ate too much, it also ruined my sleep. So, so like how many hours those, before you sleep do you take your last meal? Eight. So I, be, I eat all my food in a six hour window. I fast for 18 hours a day. So, so, so basically from like, I don't know, nine to five or, or, or nine. Yeah. To I eat from six to noon. Six to noon. -ish. Okay. So, so eight hours and then your bedtime, then you're saying is 8 PM. 8.30. Yep. 8.30. What time do you wake up? I just wake up naturally. I never wake up to an alarm. And so it's somewhere between five and six, four, between 4.30 and six. Okay. So like eight to nine hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my WASO, so like a major biological indicator of your sleep is wake after sleep onset. So basically how much time are you awake in, in the night? 
And most people have wassos like two to three hours, like they're up a substantial duration of the night. My wasso hovers around 30 minutes, which is again, a, uh, this, I think the strongest evidence of my biological age and my body of how it's behaving and my sleep is routinely knocking out that kind of, uh, wake time at that level. So you're saying while people are asleep, they're kind of without really knowing it, it's sort of ca like slightly waking up, going back to sleep, slightly waking up. And that kind of affects the quality of their sleep. Yeah, you're looking at the parameters like your deep, your REM, uh, light sleep, uh, wasso, like how much time you're actually up, tossing, turning, ruminating things in your mind. These are all, uh, these, you can all look at these, at the statistics of biological age according to the data. So you can look in the same way you distinguished before between chronological age and biological age. You can look at an organ and say, this is a heart of a 20 year old or a 10 year old or a 50 year old or 90 year old. You can also say this is the sleep characteristics of a 10 year old, a 20 year old, a 50 year old. They all have these biological age uh, markers where you can say this data resembles somebody of this age. Hmm. And so uh, what about screen time? You didn't mention screen time at all. I, yeah, I mean, I don't have any games on my phone. There, there's absolutely zero fun on my phone. <laughs> I, I hate being on my phone because it makes me feel awful. So I just don't, I'm not really tempted towards it. I, um, you know, I guess James, what I'd say that you, you were asking me before, like what my life is like, I would say, um, I have a level of steadiness of life. I never thought possible. It was always, I guess, I suppose I accepted as an entrepreneur that my life was a roller coaster, big highs, big lows, and it was just huge swings. And then on top of that, my own emotional states were huge swings, but I kind of thought that was just a game as an entrepreneur. But I think that's really just part of life. And right now my life has become stable. I don't have these roller coaster rides of emotion. And I don't, which means I, it doesn't, I don't feel a need to chase dopamine hits. I don't try to find arousal things. I'm just okay with the steadiness of my life. Uh, whereas before I was constantly hunting for my next hit, whether it was food or binge watching or a, you know, being on social media or endlessly scrolling, like all the things we do to try to deal with the discomfort of our conscious minds. I just don't have it. And, and in terms of diet, I was seeing on, on blueprint that you, you eat specifically 1,977 calories a day and you kind of lay it out. Why that number? And, and by the way, I think the average person eats about 2,800 calories a day. Right. Yeah. It's, I'm doing a caloric restriction diet and it has some compelling evidence that it slows the rate of one's aging, which I guess my data is confirming. And so my recommended daily allowance is around 2,500 calories a day. So I'm roughly 20% lower than the recommended daily allowance. I also work out an hour a day. And so it's been an interesting experiment. If you just simply say, okay, we're going to measure the body. We're going to let it report out the data. We're going to look at all the scientific evidence and then just create a protocol. And we're going to say, can the body thrive with 2000 calories a day of this food, 111 pills and this sleep routine, like just let it run, just go. Like don't fiddle with the mind, like just let it go. And we just let the system run. And so it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, previously to me doing this, I think there was a lot of opinions that you can't do caloric restriction long-term. You can't be vegan, uh, uh, you, can't, you can't do caloric restriction and vegan and exercise an hour a day and do this. Like you, those things basically don't go together. You're going to produce uh, a negative outcome. And what the data has shown is all my data shows is pointing in the right direction of, of slowed aging, perfect biomarkers, et cetera, et cetera. And so it just is really an experiment to just say, if you can have perfect control over a body and just run according to an experiment, that's what we're doing. And the data is reporting out. And so it's, it's not, uh, it's pretty interesting that the, we are at this, uh, part. I mean, like my body hovers around roughly 5% body fat and, uh, you might, it's, uh, I'm, I'm pretty must I have, I have quite a bit of muscle. I'm very athletic. Um, I, on all the, all the fitness score test scores, I perform very well, oftentimes, uh, competitive with 18 year olds. And so, so in terms of like, um, the caloric restriction, do you ever feel like, oh, you know, I have a, a big day ahead. I better get enough, you know, I don't know. Right. Gluc glycogen in or whatever yeah. it is to, to have the energy. I need so many calories of this per day to have the energy to, to function. Do you ever get like tired from the caloric restriction? Yeah. 
I mean, that I agree. That is a reasonable thought. And the answer is no, we don't do it. It's the same caloric input every single day, no matter what. Hmm. And I suppose it does matter the quality of the food, like in terms of like, uh, you know, whether it's Doritos yeah. or or organic or whatever. Yeah. So when you list on the blueprint, like the foods you eat and, and so on. And, and then there's the supplements. You said 111 pills. What percentage of the age reversal do you think is due to the pills versus uh, yeah. diet and sleep? Yeah, the, so the two th yeah, it's 2,000 calories and 111 pills. And that's the output of having run this closed loop process for two years. Uh, we've done like six or seven cycles now where a whole body measurement of all these different modalities reports out the data, and then we correct for the input. So the, the 2,000 calorie uh, budget every day, every single calorie has had to fight for its life to exist. Nothing exists in there which is superfluous. It has a specific uh, target and a thing we can measure specifically for that thing. And so it's that precise. And then 111 supplements is to compensate for the caloric restriction because when you're in that caloric restricted uh, diet, you need to get certain things as part of your, your body to be properly functioning. And two is to compensate for that I'm vegan. So I need to have a certain sources of, of nutrients. And then the other stuff is just the supplements added to slow my speed of aging. So there are things that are contributing to the overall wellness of my body. The expectation is not that people uh, is go are going to do the entirety of Blueprint. It's a lot to do the measurement. But the easy translatability of people that I'm doing is just get great sleep. Here are the recipes of the foods you eat on a daily basis that are very good for you. And if you want to do a few supplements, okay. But it, I I'm really trying to ask the question in the early 21st century, if somebody, if their body were to be a perfect experimental environment and you were able to put the very best science into a person and they were to be perfectly disciplined to execute it, that's what I'm trying to prove out. And that thing is to give people a reference point. The amazing things about humans is once one human shows something's possible, every human can do it. Like we see, we've seen this with uh, over and over again, the four minute mile, like once somebody shows it's done, sure. all of a sudden hundreds and thousands of people can do it. And I so like I'm trying to basically kick off a cascade. I mean, I like this idea of looking at it almost as like an athletic event because it gives it a uh, purpose and meaning that might not exist mm -hmm. otherwise. Yes, that's right. So people are willing yeah, I, to get, I, you know, people are willing to get better at tennis to win the championship at their club. You know, yes. Otherwise, they view it as maybe a waste of time, but they have like some meaning to it, and then it, it makes it more meaningful. Now, everybody would like to reverse aging and take a pill and have it happen ma magically, but it doesn't really work that way. Yeah. But where do you see your like? What do you look like and feel like twenty years from now? Like, where does yeah. this plateau and reverse at some point, or yeah. just slow? I mean, so to your previous question, quickly. Uh, this week, I was provocative on social media in, in that I said, Blueprint is the best wellness uh, protocol ever put together in history. And prove me otherwise with your own data. And so I, I say this not to try to be number one. I say this because if somebody were to beat me, it would be the best possible outcome I could, I could imagine. Hmm. Because then you have someone else showing up with data that their protocol has exceeded mine, which is amazing because then it's going to kick off others who want to then compete and beat them. And so what I'm really trying to do is punch through the noise of the tribal-like arguments that exist in health and wellness that leave everyone in society confused. Nobody knows what to do because it's all human opinion play the sport with data. So it's fun. And if I'm trying to provoke this competition, so others show up and it helps everyone else. But then to your point, it's like, what, what do smartphones look like in 20 years? And in that sense, we all think, oh, it's going to be clearly better because we know there's hundreds of thousands of, there's millions of people working on improving smartphones on the entire supply chain from the ASIC all the way through the cameras and software, all the above. If we look at the human though, and we say, okay, what are humans going to look, look like in 20 years? We want to have the same level of hope about our ability to improve as we do our technology. Like, wouldn't it be amazing if we're sitting around the couch like James, yo, isn't it going to be amazing? Like, think about what it's going to be like to be human in 20 years if we have attached ourselves 
to this compounded rate of improvement for society instead of us just accepting we're in decay and decline and we're drinking and eating terrible food and just walking to our inevitable decay. We want to have the same level of hope about our own potentials we do our technology. And right now we have it entirely backwards. Right. And so, so given your approach and how it's been working so far, like five years, 10 years, 20 years out, do you think you still will have kind of the, the aging process of a 10 year old? Do you think your heart will be at the level of a 20 year old, even when you're 65, like at some point, are, are you fighting against city hall in some sense where mm -hmm. you, know, you can't yeah. fight city hall? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I'm trying to prove longevity, escape, velocity. I'm trying to show that time passes, but I stay the exact same age. And so that's done in two ways. One is you slow the speed of aging because we're not going to solve entropy. That's just like a force of the universe that is going on. So even with our bootstrapped effort of two years and being slower than the average 10 year old, phenomenal starting point, like unbelievably great starting point. What we're doing now is we're now looking at the next phase of blueprint, which is reversing the aging damage that has happened. So truly trying to reverse biological age. And I think that's when it gets a lot more interesting is even if I'm uh, aging at a speed less than a 10 year old, I'm still aging. So we need to dial back the clock uh, continually on doing that. And so we're just putting our attention on that now. But the thing that's exciting is if we can show, if blueprint can demonstrate there are meaningful gains one can make in slowing and reversing aging, it's gonna kick up an entire cascade of focus. And it could be an avalanche of change in our society to say, this self-destructive harm we're doing to ourselves and others is kind of insane. It's kind of the most dangerous thing we're doing to the species. It's at the root of everything else going on in the technology we build. When we're scared of Sandy, you know, when we're scared of the chat <laughs> bot of Sandy, we're just looking at ourselves in the mirror. We need to be what we want AI to become. When we look at ourselves and we're at each other's throat uh, with these terribly powerful weapons, we're at each other's throat for these same three reasons. Like we, if we really think about the future of being human, and I would love to have the hope myself to say, we're locked in as a society. Like we're basically gonna say, it is stupid that we ask people right now to walk or drive past 10 fast food restaurants and 10 chains offering 50 grams of sugar in a drink before work and then asking them to, to stay off their phones the addiction of social media and avoid binge watching something and avoid porn and avoid the addiction of all the foods where the companies are trying to make you addicted to everything you're doing like we're in a walking addiction in our society and we celebrate it and we protect it so when someone if someone like me wants to go to bed on time and get great sleep it's like that's weird it's all backwards you know it's interesting because it reminds me of an experiment i once did where I refuse to shop for food because when you go, sh like my point was you could never go to a restaurant and order a plate of Doritos for dessert. Like no restaurant or offers you, uh, you know, Oreos and potato chips for dessert. It's always like just a little mm -hmm. thing. And, and so, yeah. so actually I could avoid a lot of bad foods by simply not shopping because most of the food in the store, mm -hmm. you have to use enormous amounts of willpower to not buy the things you like. So, but if I just never go to the store and I always order food prepared by a chef and, you know, mm -hmm. in reasonable amounts, it's, it, you know, it was, it was an interesting way to, to die and not, and, and, yeah. and ha not have to have self-control. You want to avoid the moments where you need self-control. And that's what it seems like you've done in a lot of cases. Yeah, exactly. Like we, our, our, our ancestors needed to be aware of the lion hiding. And now the lion in our modern day is modern society. It is lurking and trying to addict us to everything in sight. And it has the worst of intentions of what it's going to do to us. And we celebrate and, it. And so now in terms of, in terms of aging, there's also technological factors. So you, you, you know, there's a, a lot of, you've made, mentioned a lot of guidance on sleep diet, uh, on your website, there's your, your workout. And, you know, so these are all great. And I agree with you that these are the most important things, but then that, now there's all this you know, kind of levels of technology, like you mentioned before, is NR supplements good or NMN supplements good? And then beyond that, if we take the stem cells of a fetus and inject it into our body, will that make us younger? And then beyond that, there's these things called Yamanaka factors that are being mm -hmm. experimented on. And it's it's shown to reverse considerably the age of, of yep. mice. Like when do these technological factors start to play a role? And are you experimenting with them at all? We are. 
Yep. So it's very promising. And I agree with you on all the potential, the things you just laid out. And the thing we want is we want to peg ourselves on that improvement curve. We want the, when those things come to market, we want it to be rolled out like a software update on a smartphone. Everyone mm -hmm. gets it. We want all humans to receive all these updates because we want to, we want to be unified and say, it is foolish for us to commit self-destructive behavior. No matter how pretty the story is, it is foolish for us to try to get each other to commit self-destructive behavior. And we just need to, uh, if we want to imagine a bright future, one that is majestic, we need to shift our way of thinking. So these uh, updates are just automatic. It's, they're not for the rich. It's not a inequality thing. It just, it rolls through society because that's how we build it. And what, what technological things are you most excited about in the short term? Like, will stem cells be a thing? Will uh, these Yamanaka factors be a thing? What, what's, what, what, what excites you the most there? There's no silver bullet right now. It's just a bunch of small things. So caloric restriction has the most compelling evidence, I think, out of anything. Hmm. Eating less and eating the right food is the most powerful thing somebody can do right now. But doing that, you need to have good sleep. So like, if you just get sleep and diet right, you're getting the majority of the benefits. Like that's really where the power laws are right now in, in medicine. You, of course, people love talking about magic pills. They love thinking about magic pills. They love anticipating magic pills because it kind of covers up the hard work you need to do to get there. And those things will come in time. They'll have certain effect sizes, TBD, what they are. But we really just want to be in a position that they can, we can adapt them, adopt them when they're ready to go, but we're not waiting for them. And let me ask you a question that will, will almost sound like a segue. How important is optimism and let's say positive thinking? I So I, I told you I became a pilot. I love flying and I got typed in all the airplanes. I've flown small airplanes, I've flown jets, all different types. No matter how hard I've trained, no matter how much time I spend in the cockpit, I am never as good as a professional pilot. So when I get in that cockpit and I watch how fluid they are with their controls and what happens in an emergency, they're always better than I am because they think about it and do, do it every day, all day. Where I, as, a, as an amateur pilot, jump in the plane, have some allocation of my time, but otherwise like my brain's off somewhere else. And in these situations like uh, NR and NMN or like this or that, uh, I don't ever want to express an opinion because it's inferior to the professionals who eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff. I mean, the people on my team have been doing this for decades. It's all they've ever done. And so they just have this knowledge base and these intuitions about all this interconnectedness that I don't have. And so I really, I know my area of expertise and where I'm good at, but I'm not going to jump in the fray and begin to pretend. I used to do this as a, like an amateur biohacker, read blogs, listen to podcasts, read books, take my little bag around and, you know, put the tips and tricks. But if you look at my data, I was awful. Like, you know, like I maybe did something, but like not great. So it's really been a, a work of a, a professional team. And I've, you know, I've spent millions of dollars doing this. I've made it all free for everyone else. I basically said like, look, if you're trying to do well in life, don't worry about going out and learning this stuff on your, on your own. Just do what I've done. Like, here's all my data. Like you, you've got a very clean path. So if currently no one in the world is as good as Blueprint. Hmm. Now, if someone is better, great. They have two options, but they have, there's a very clean path right now if you want to start doing something. Yeah, and, and let's say you were going to try to learn something new that let's say normally it would take a young person to learn. So for instance, playing the piano, you have a certain type of muscle memory when you're young, it, it, you have less capable muscle memory when you're older. So it's harder to learn how to play the piano when you're older. Do you think that is the sort of thing that is already reversing with you or could be reversed uh, in terms of, you know, being able to learn at an older age. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that neuroplasticity continues into older mm -hmm. ages, but the reality is you kind of lose more than you gain in, in the process of aging yeah. in the brain. Yeah. I mean, I see this in my muscle. It, like I, I struggle to be sore from anything, no matter my physical exertion, I just don't get sore. And I've had a lot of people tell me that too. Once they started the blueprint protocol, they just don't get sore ever. Now I'm sure some people with certain exertion would find it, but that's like one effect you're saying is so with my muscle and my recovery, it just seems like my body just has endlessly capable of doing whatever I want. And I don't, I'm not doing extreme things. I'm not running marathons. I'm not doing extreme athletics. So I haven't really pushed the boundaries, but still like if you're trying to say what is generally going on, what can I be aware of? So is my brain doing something similar potentially in terms of my 
my cognition, my memory, my ability to learn, certainly possible. I mean, I know that from my brain scans, my brain has dramatically reversed in age. And, and what does it show? What does the brain scan show? Does it show that there's more electrical activity happening than was happening, let's say, a month earlier because, you know, it's trending in a good direction? Like, what does it actually show? Yeah, one of the major findings we had is there's just, uh, I knew from my experience in health and wellness, I was invested in this company that was doing a bunch of whole body imaging for people. And it was a very common story where somebody would walk in and be confident with their physical, and then they would the whole body imaging and they do it and they'd find a tumor or some life threatening thing, this time bomb. And the person would say like, I can't believe it. I live a really clean life. I just have my doc, my, my annual with my doctor. And uh, then they would get, get it addressed and be okay. But they just hadn't been subjected to this robustness of measurement that happens at this, at this clinic. And so I knew that when I started blueprint, I was going to find a ticking time bomb that uh, was going to be unnerving. I just didn't know when. And we found one. We found my. Uh, we found internal jugular vein stenosis, which means these two little pipes on the side of the neck, which have blood flow from the brain coming out, were stenosed, uh, were blocked. And two reasons why. One is I have congenitally small veins, so gen genetically they're very small. And then two, my poor posture. So I had my neck out. It was impinging the, the vein further, which limited the blood flow. And this was causing white matter hyperintensities in my brain. So uh, white matter hyperintensities are like scarring for the brain. You see it in MS patients, and then as age, uh, they accumulate with age. And so once I corrected for my posture and started Blueprint, my white matter hyperintensities uh, from an age biomarker reversed 22 years. Wow. So, so it's interesting. So have you ever seen um, Dan Buettner's book, uh, The Blue Zones, about areas of the world where people live, you know, unusually long lives with high quality of life. It's like seven mm -hmm. different. I'm familiar zones. with it. Yes. And, and one of the conclusions he comes up with is that very important for living longer and, and even keeping the brain healthy is social interaction. So like friendships, mm -hmm. for instance, and, and mm -hmm. having high quality social interactions. Have you found that also in your journey on this? I have. Yeah. I mean, so one of the most common reactions to blueprint is people I'll say this, uh, almost all the intuitions somebody has about blueprint are wrong. And so let me give you a few that people say one is they, they say they go through a list of, I could never do that because, and they go through their loss list, which means I can't drink late at night with my friends. I can't have that bagel every Saturday morning when I go to blank blank. Like they go through all their, their special little vices that they love. And what they're saying in that is they're saying, uh, it's going to be impossible for me as a human to change my life in any way where I'm not equally, if not happier, which we know is entirely false, right? That whatever we are today, we can adjust, we adjust to a new norm and we may be equally happy, if not more happy. So people are just trying to say, I can't change, which is not true. They can. And then they go through other, other lists of all the reasons why they, they, they assume I'm miserable. They assume I have no life. They assume I have no fun. So they basically are projecting onto me all the reasons why it's impossible for them to change. And they almost want the worst for me because that means if they could find evidence that's bad for me, they don't need to change, but it's not true. And so I'm having more fun than I've ever had, more, uh, more rewarding fun than I've ever had. Uh, my consciousness is more expansive than it's ever been. I have deeper friendships than I've ever had because it's based upon this shared value of doing things that are productive for us versus destructive. So to me, it's just interesting that the knee-jerk reactions typically have it entirely backwards. It's also interesting, and uh, and I really am going to try. I'm going to try Blueprint. And do you want to just tell the URL to everyone what, what it is, where they can go, how they can do it? Yeah, blueprint.brianjohnson.co. It's all there. And you should have a company that uh, makes the meals and sends them out to everyone. You know, make like a week worth of meals so that people can subscribe so they don't have to think about it. Yeah, I know. It's an issue. When, when Blueprint uh, gained global notoriety, all the suppliers we had emailed me like, what's going on? <laughs> like we're sold out for six months. Uh, it was a huge land grab for everything. So yeah, I'm trying to look into that to see if there's a fix for it because it's, I mean, putting Blueprint together is hard. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, the number of people that actually are going to do it is small. If we can make it dead simple, it would be a helpful thing for people. So yeah, I'm looking into it. I know that it's a big lift.
But you know, like the thing is, you don't have to do all of it. If you just get these basics right, it's a really positive step in the right direction. Just get sleep right. And if you get sleep right, just start, you know, like the other thing is just try to identify your evening Brian. And you know who that person is. Like they're a version of you that shows up at a predictable time and they somehow persuade you to engage in self-destructive behaviors that you know you don't like. If well, you will, could will really power, have a choice, you wouldn't do it. I mean, willpower goes down throughout the day, right? That's why we sleep is we wake up with as much willpower as we're going to have for the rest of the day. And then for the rest of the day, it declines. And so at night, oh, you're trying to avoid the ice cream. You just don't have yeah. enough willpower. And you're trying to avoid the binge watch. You just don't have enough willpower left. Like you go straight yeah. into it. Now, I noticed, yeah, there's before, a gra- I noticed before you sleep, you take melatonin and there's always been lots of back and forth with melatonin. Like you, you never yeah. wake up groggy with it or like, how did you determine the right amount for you? Yeah. The answer to everything we do at blueprint evidence-based medicine, hmm. it, everything we do has had to fight for its life through a review of evidence. Now, two reasonable scientists can look at the same evidence and come up with different conclusions, totally expected and fine, which is like, well, what I'm trying to spawn up with blueprint is others to compete with us. So my dose of melatonin is 300 MCGs every night. So it's a very low dose. Uh, it has evidence behind it. So, you know, and my sleep is like the data is I have near perfect sleep every single night. And so is melatonin doing its job? Maybe if we pulled it out, would it do the same? Maybe like, you know, like we haven't done that, that one confound. We do other things on sleep as well, but it's fine if people disagree with each other on evidence-based medicine, that's a totally expected at the stage of the game where we're at. And uh, if, maybe we make it to a time and place where it can be that individualized, where you've got enough data measurement on people to do it. But yeah, I take it, and that's what the case. Everything else, like like for example, James, if you one thing that I really enjoy about Blueprint uh, is I look forward to eating more so, and I appreciate eating more than I ever have in my entire life because okay, uh, because it's so constrained. And so this idea of caloric restriction of restraining. The, the things I get in life has increased my appreciation for life more than anything else. Uh, so just, that's why I feel so alive more so than I ever have in my entire life. It's very hard to articulate in words. It's like we were saying with the altered state of consciousness, it's just very hard to explain to somebody without them personally experiencing it. Well, Brian, it's such an inspirational story and I hope a lot of people pay attention to this. Uh, again, go to blueprint.brianjohnson.co. Uh, and you can see all the details, including Brian's daily routine, what he measures, diet stuff, exercise stuff, the whole thing. Brian, thank you so much for sharing this and coming on the show. And I hope we have you on again in 20 years and you look even better than you do now. So that's exciting. Thank you. Even, yeah, even two years. Thanks, James, for having me.